So really, this, the impetus of this talk was they approached me at, at Ascris. Ascris was not getting enough residents coming because department chairs send their residents to either AAO or ARVO. Now, if you're doing research, it makes sense to go to ARVO, but there's no sense to go to AAO. I, AAO is worthless for a resident. But, you know, because department chairs tend to be retina people and, you know, neuro-ophthalmologists and all, they just don't send residents to ask us. And so we, we made it so that it's free to go, and then we put together a resident fellows program. And we tried to make it useful. And so it was a half-day program. You know, we'd give you breakfast, we'd give you lunch, and then... You know, one of them was, you know, how do you, you know, fill out the forms? How do you choose the code numbers? You know, they had Kevin Cochran who, if you're in practice, you have to pay thousands to get him to, you know, come and tell you how to run a practice. And he gave talks on how to run a practice. And then, so they asked me to, to give a talk on, okay, how do you present? How do you do public speaking? How do you prepare a talk? How do you um, give a talk? And then also they said, you know, how do you prepare a paper? And nobody ever talks to residents about that. Nobody ever sits you down and says, okay, here's how you give a talk. You just kind of wing it and then watch what everybody else does and then eventually pick it up. So I thought I'd put together a little talk on how to, you know, prepare for public speaking. And, I mean, the first thing, this is obvious, but, but you don't know how many people stumble on this. Know your material. I mean, before you're going to give a talk, you have to know what you're talking about inside and out. And you'd be amazed at how many people, you ask them a question, you know, even at residence day, we try to be really nice and we ask somebody a question or when the students give these talks, especially at Grand Islands, you ask them a question and, and yes, they've memorized what they put in there, but you ask the question, okay, well, what does this mean here? And they're just clueless. And so you really need to research what it is that you're going to talk and anticipate you know, what are some potential questions and what people could be asking, because that's critical to know how to answer them. And I've seen it time after time where, especially the students when they prepare, you know, they, you just do a very superficial talk and it's like, you know, we, we all know what you're presenting. We know that stuff already. So, you know, tell us something new. So, you know, always look at all the references, dig up the background. I mean, just take the time and, you know, if you're going to be giving statistics, especially review all your stats, because People are going to maybe ask you questions, well, wait a minute, this group did this, this group did that. Did you look at it in this way or that way? So preparation is just critical. You really got to know your material ahead of time. You know, the second thing is know your audience. And there are different talks that, that we do. And, for example, if you're talking among your colleagues or I'm talking to you guys, you know, it's a different level. So if I'm talking to you guys, I have to really just dumb down the talk to, to make it so that you guys can understand it. No, but, but know your audience. And so every once in a while, we'll be asked to talk to lay people about, you know, ophthalmology to get them excited about what we're doing on our department here. And you don't want to put jargon in there. You don't want to just talk scientifically. You want to talk at a level that people can understand. And so that's really critical to know your audience. I mean, it's different if it's students, residents. Lay people is critical because if you just get up there and say, oh, well, you know, FLIT 2732 gene is da 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 in macular degeneration, people aren't going to have any idea what that means. And so you want to say, hey, listen, macular degeneration is the most common cause of visual loss now as, as we age and our society is aging, so this is a real problem. One of the things we've looked into is, is there a connection between genetics and this disease? And then you keep it on a level that people can understand. Now, you don't want to talk down to them, so that's always a very fine line because you don't want to be you know, condescending or anything like that, but you want to put it at a level where people can understand it. And I think we have a tendency as doctors to put a lot of jargon in our talks, and people don't understand jargon. Now, that, that doesn't even just mean when you're talking to lay people. I mean, Grand Rounds two weeks ago, um, you know, we went in and the speaker was talking about all these various diseases that Paul Bernstein was all excited and jumping up about. I had no idea what the guy was talking about. <laughs> and so you have to be careful to keep it at a level. No, no, I had no idea. It's like, so you have to keep it at a level that, that, that people could understand. And so remember, not everybody knows your little field of, of ophthalmology. So always keep that in mind when you talk to them. You know, the second thing is what kind of talk is it? You know, there's different types of talk. There's going to be the the scientific presentation where it's very much a, you guys are too young to remember the old 
TV show Dragnet, but you know, Dragnet was a, was a show where there were these two very stiff detectives, and, and Jack Webb's favorite line was, you know, they'd be interviewing people about what happened at the crime, and he'd go, just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> you know, and so it's just the facts, ma'am, is, is a scientific presentation, and so you want to keep it really focused and on key. But there's other types of talks. If you're a guest speaker, you know, you're giving a speech somewhere else, you know, that's going to be a long talk that may be a 45-minute talk, and in that case, you're allowed to talk a little bit about where you're from, maybe even show some pictures. I always show a picture of Moran or show a picture of the mountains in Utah or something. And so if you're an invited speaker, that's a, that's a different audience you're looking at. And if you're a keynote, that's even more so because then you have to thank everybody and you thank, you know, the academy and you thank your, you know, parents for having you and all that. And so <laughs> it, it's a very different talk. Now, the length of the talk is critical and there's several different talks. You know, the average talk at an academy or you know, Arvo or SCRS is a five to seven minute talk. So you really have to be concise and follow the outline. You know, you wanna go ahead and present, you know, what you're gonna study, your materials and methods, your results and your, you know, conclusions. And you wanna be really brief and to the point. You know, if you're given the 20 minute talk, this may be a grand rounds talk, or this may be a residence day talk. And so this is a little bit different. And then lastly, as you know, the 45 to 60 minute talk, this is when you're the keynote or you're the presenter. and and you know, 45 to 60 minutes is a long time to talk. <laughs> and so you want to keep in mind that you want to pace it just right and you want to not drone and you want to make sure that you keep your audience interested. And so if you're giving a longer talk, then you can intersperse it with you know, scenery slides, funny slides, things like that. You're allowed to do that. In a five to seven minute talk, there's just no time. So in that talk, you have to be very, very precise. Okay, so, you know. That said, you know, you just you spice it up once in a while, see if people are paying attention. All right, so the slides are the key. Now, most people are doing PowerPoint or whatever Apple's PowerPoint is called. And so you want to go ahead and, and you want to follow that format. Good evening. So we're in the middle of talking about how to give a talk. And so the first thing when you give a talk is show up on time for the talk. That's critical. <laughs> All right, so in terms of the slides, what is the order of slides? Now, again, this kind of goes without say, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't do this. And so obviously you want to put on a title, and nowadays disclosures are critical. You guys don't have to worry about this because you don't have any disclosures, but eventually in your careers, you know, you're going to have times where you get funding from various companies or you get grants and things, and so disclosures are critical. So you have to have your disclosures on the first or the second slide, and you have to acknowledge them now or people will like kick you out of the meeting next year. I mean, they're very serious about this. And so you have to say, these are my disclosures, none of them apply, or you know, I have a grant for this particular talk, or I receive travel to give this talk. That's important. You know, you want to do your introduction. What are you talking about? People sometimes can't tell from the title exactly what it is. You want to keep it brief, almost like a synopsis, but you want to kind of introduce what the problem is that you're covering and why you're giving that talk. You know, materials and methods are critical because you want to say, what am I doing? What did I do? And so again, you don't want to bog down in details. Again, depending on the talk, if it's a five to seven minute talk, you don't have much time to do this, but you want to say, okay, we looked at 100 patients, group A did this, group B did this, this is what we did to them. And when you're doing the materials and methods, it's okay to put drawings in there, it's okay to put little listings in there, that's no problem. Results are the crux of your talk. So if you're going to give a brief talk, you want to save about half the time for your results because that's the gist of your talk. And so don't spend so much time doing the introduction that you're already four minutes into a seven-minute talk. You haven't given your results yet. And then just like everything else, you do um, discussion and conclusions. And so you want to keep your conclusions succinct because you want people to walk away and say, oh, okay, that's what they did. I get it. I understand. And so you know, your conclusion should be a highlight of exactly what your, what your talk was about. All right, so the PowerPoint slides themselves. Use bullet points, use dashes, use dots, use bullets. This is not your talk on there. People want to listen to you. They don't want to read your slides. And, and the one thing I found that the people do is they put way too much text on their slides. So you don't want to put your whole talk on there. But sometimes I feel like I'll forget to say something if I don't. Bring notes for you to look at. 
it's okay to do that. That's right. I'm getting to that. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But but the text on there, if people are busy reading what's on there, they're not going to listen to what you say. So you can expand on what you put on your on your um, slide, but but minimize the text, because if you put too much text, it just gets really hard. You know, photos, graphs, and tables are really helpful. You know, if you've got you're comparing say two groups, it's great to have a graph on there showing. You know, here's group A and here's group B and then you put the bars on there. Well, look at the difference. And so graphs and tables are really helpful, especially if you've got lots of data. And so go ahead and use those to summarize things. Don't put too much information and animation. And I have seen people, they love computers and so they're playing with them all and they've got stuff flashing back and forth and coming in and out and, and that's okay to a small extent. But if you put too much in there, again, it, it overwhelms your audience. So. You know, don't put too much, just enough. Now, you've heard the saying, death by PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, so this is, you know, you don't know how many times I see this when you look around the audience and they'll go, you know, or, or no, nowadays it's different. Now they're doing this. Now they're going, you know, so everybody's in there doing this, so nobody's paying attention. And so, I mean, that's really talked about, death by PowerPoint. And so be careful what you put in there because you can kill an audience with your PowerPoint. Now, you know, when I say don't put too much information in, okay, here's an actual PowerPoint slide. This is what people use for, you know, examples. Okay, now, can you really read anything out of that slide? I mean, there's, there's no way you're going to be, able, you know, come on. So you put the bullets that highlight it, and then you can expand on it a little bit. Other thing people do, font size. You know, you just, they play around. This font's too big. It's too small, you try to cram in, you know, find a font that works for you and that people can read. And so think about it. Somebody's going to be sitting in the back there. They need to be able to see what you're putting there. So keep it big. The other thing that's one of my personal pet peeves is, is color and, um, and animation. Okay so, okay, so here's the animation, all right? So again, if there's too much going on, it actually doesn't enhance the talk, it detracts from the talk. And so be careful you don't put too much in there. And you know, you don't know how many times you see people who have these complex charts and graphs and there's just so much data there. And of course, what do we all say when we do that? Oh, I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide. How many times have you done that? I mean, I've done that, I'm guilty of that. I go, well, sorry, this is a busy slide. Well, don't say, sorry, this is a busy slide. Don't make a busy slide. You know, keep it simple. You know, so again, too much text, too many bullets, you know, fonts that aren't easy to use. People have these scrolled fonts. I mean, that's fine when you're, what's that? I thought I loved those. No, that's, that's fine. I, I don't want to insult you guys, but that's fine when you're a seventh grade girl. You know, and you want the curlies behind you and you put the little circle over the eye, you know. And that's okay, but, but not for people to read it. So, you know, that's the problem. And, and again, if you put too many different presentation styles, you've got different things in different parts of the talk, try to be consistent, and then people can actually follow your talk. Now again, oh here's this, well, this is kind of a busy slide. I mean, this isn't a busy slide, what is that? It looks like an ink blot test, you know, so. This is the test where you look at it and say, well, I don't, know, I don't know about you guys, you ever seen ink blots, you know, that the psychiatrist uses, you know, they're, they're trying to see if you're psychotic or not. I thought they looked like MRI scans, and so I said, oh, look, there's the amygdala, and there's the brain, you know. So. Now, the, the other thing that, that people often do is colors. And the problem is, is if you have a different background, like, you know, the red background, and then you put some lighter letters, people can't see it. So you want to have a good background that people can see. And again, you know, don't use the junior high girl font, you know, that just, it's just not, not the kind. So, but, but remember, I, you know, first I thought red looked kind of cool. And then I actually sat back at the back of a room and watched somebody give a talk where it was the red there. You couldn't read it. So you want to make sure that you use a color and a background that people can read that stands out. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be blah. I mean, I see people who just do the standard, which is, white with black letters on it. That's blah, you don't have to do that. You can put some stuff in. Sometimes you can put little mountains on or little sunbursts, you know. But the key is like, look right here, you know, okay, there's little, little lines up above and below. That sets it off. That doesn't 
detract from the talk. That kind of highlights what you want to do. So when you're making your slides, you know, be sure to try to keep the talk interesting. And again, if it's a short talk, you don't have time to do that, so just hit the highlights. But if it's a longer talk, like a residence day talk, you know, you're allowed to, to splash a little bit in there to keep, it, to keep it fun and to keep it interesting. And the other thing, keep it light. You know, you don't have to be, to be heavy about it. You're allowed to put funny jokes or slides. Now, there's a fine line between what you can do because you don't want to insult people. And so, so that's it. And, and nowadays, God, medical students now are just getting unbelievable. They're insulted by everything nowadays. It's, it's ridiculous. You can't do anything. So, you know, be careful. Don't, don't do anything that's considered inappropriate. Scenery slides are fine, especially because we live in the mountains. You're allowed to show your slides hiking or biking or whatever. I mean, those are okay because those help to do it. You know, I can show slides of where I'm from, and so I'll always show my travel slides. And so you can show slides like this, but you know, and, and you can make jokes about it. And I always make sure to tell you guys, you know, this is the, this is where the Oracle at Delphi was. And so, you know, this is where I go to get help to predict how the residents are going to be in the OR the next year. <laughs> and so you're definitely allowed to do that. And, you know, you can talk about things. Now, I, I always joke about this when I show the medical students. This is one of the Evzons who guards the um, Tomb of the Unknown Sh Soldier. And I mean, these guys are unbelievable. They're, they're, it's really competitive to do this. And it's interesting, the two criteria to be one of these guys is you have to be six feet tall at least, and you have to be handsome. And so I'm thinking, man, that's discriminatory. You know, short, fat guys are out of it, forget it. So, But the other thing I always say is, is you have to be very secure in your manhood because you're wearing a skirt, white tights, and pom-pom on your shoes. And, and, a and, and a short skirt. And so you have to have good legs. And so, But now I have to be careful because somebody may take that as offensive. And so I have to, it's really iffy whether you can say those, those nowadays. Now, it's funny because I lecture the medical students and, and I give them a talk on ocular pathology and they've cut it in half now. So I've got to cram all of ocular pathology in an hour and I don't have much time. So I, I cram a lot in there, but I try to keep it light. The medical students this year just skewered me. I mean, they're saying, oh, why are you wasting time showing travel slides? Just show the, you know, what you need. And, and oh. just these picky, nasty comments, and I'm like going, I'm like going, guys, get a life. And, it's just, <laughs> and, and it, gets, it gets worse every year. You know, 20 years ago, the med students would love putting stuff like that. Now they're all, and, and the other thing is, is I give them a complete outline with all the arrows on there and all the legends underneath, and I send it to them separately and say, okay, this is what you need to do. And I even tell them at the beginning of the talk, now, You've gotten a complete outline. It's got all this stuff in there. We're just going to rapidly go through here. And again, I get half a dozen comments. Well, there's like no legends on the pictures, and they went too fast to see them. It's like, well, read the freaking outline, you know? <laughs> I mean, so I was just, that's my, my peeve now. The med students are just, they're just off. This year's second year class is awful. <laughs> they really are. They're just awful. Well, and here's the example. I used to show this slide, and I thought this was pretty funny. I would, I would show it, and people would laugh. And again, a few years ago, I had several students say, what, does that mean that, you know, the faculty thinks they can shit on students, and that's all they think about, you know, and that's what they think of students? So I had to cut it out. So again, be careful what you show, because you don't want to insult somebody. And so who knows? This is insulting. All right, so public speaking. You cannot prepare enough for your talk. And you don't have to, to, to totally memorize it, but you've got to know your talk cold. And so, you know, you can practice, practice, prepare, prepare. If you don't know that topic cold, you're going to be in trouble. So take the time to know your topic. Practice with people, your fellow residents. Um, if you've got a mentor and attending you did research, or present it to them and, and ask them for comments. Get your significant other to sit down with you and show it to them and, and you know, they'll go ahead and, and critique you and say, okay, what do you think of this talk? Time yourself. You know, actually get the talk ready ahead of time, prepare it and time it. So timing is critical because you don't want to go too short or too long. So when you're doing the, the, the talk prep, every meeting now has a speaker ready room. And here, like if it's, you know, resident day, you want to get it to the people at, at you know, audio visual ahead of time. But a lot of meetings, they'll have a speaker ready room. And so people will have their talk on a stick or on a CD or DVD or whatever. But 
you know, you think that it's going to work, but maybe not. And so take it to the speaker ready room ahead of time, plug it in, and someone will sit down with you and go over it and make sure it really works and make sure all the videos, if you have videos, are linked together because there's nothing bigger disaster than getting up to give your talk and your talk doesn't work, especially if you've got like sound effects and other things in there. So go to the speaker ready room, get it ready, work with the staff because you want that talk to be ready. And, and again, especially if you've got videos, you know, you don't know how many times I've been in a talk and gosh, show a video, oh, it doesn't work. I mean, that, the video is the gist of what you're trying to show, so make sure that it works. You know, the other thing is visit the podium prior to your talk. You know, and, and it's okay, maybe you're at a session at Arvo or Academy or something, and you know, the podium's there. Go there before the session starts, and you know, sneak up to the podium and see what it looks like. They put, sometimes they'll have a pointer, sometimes they'll have a clicker, they'll have a computer there sometimes, and every podium is different. You see where the microphone is, and so you don't want to get up there at the last minute and then say, oh, where is this? And so take the time ahead of time, visit the podium, and go up there and, and uh, do that. Now, you know, look at the ways to advance the slides. As I said, is it a clicker down here? Is it a mouse? Is it a just forward and back slide? And then, you know, is there a pointer? You know, is, do you use the button on the computer? Do you use the pointer? That's really helpful to do that. Now, once you're at the podium, how do you actually give the talk? And, and you can do it several different ways. When I first started, like, you know, you guys are going to be starting now, I would take an outline with me to the podium where you would actually have either the PowerPoint there, you'd have notes to yourself or something like that. And so you can take that with you. Some people, if they did debate in high school, you know, they have little cards with them. Other people have different ways of doing it. You can even bring your, you know, laptop or your, you know, MacBook and put it up there and do it. However you want to do it is fine. You know, after a while, when you've done, you know, 500 of these things, you don't bring anything with you. You just use the slides to cue you. But when you're first starting, I think it's a good idea to do that. Or the other thing you can do is, you know, when you're in the audience ahead of time and your time is coming up to talk, you know, you can have that outline with you and just kind of review it before you go up. But the worst thing you want to do is, is you don't want to be reading from a script. Okay, so occasionally you put in a, you know, you put in something, see if people are paying attention, so. All right, so the worst thing that, that I find is that people who read from a script, and that's just horrible, and all I can think of is, did you ever see Forrest Bueller's Day Off? You know, Ben Stein, the comedian, Bueller, Bueller. You know, I mean, yeah, nobody's going to pay attention when you do that. I don't say how many people I've seen who go, and, you know, don't, don't look at what you're reading. Look at your audience because you've got to engage, especially if they're falling asleep. So if you're in a smaller room and you look right at somebody, they sit up, you know, and they start paying attention. And so, you know, do that. But, if you're in a bigger room, you may not be able to see them because the other thing that's going to be hard is when you're at a big meeting and you're on the podium, they video it. So it's not even brighter than that. You can't see anything. You just look out and there's just this blackness out there. So don't worry about that. Um, you know, have your cues and whatever you want, but don't read from a script because it's really just, just it gives for a bad talk. You can change your voice tones a little bit. You can go up, you can go down, you can speed up, you can slow down, but don't just don't be a liar, you know. And, and he was, Ben Stein, he was a teacher, I think, in the Wonder Years, too. He was like a science teacher. And the volcanoes go off, and it goes in the thing. You know, don't, don't drone. I mean, you know, change your voice, do your inclination. I like to use my slides as a key to what I want to talk about, but you have to know your stuff cold when you do that. So when you show the slide, you know, okay, this is the result slide and this is what I want to stress. So it's okay to bring little cheat sheets with you or outlines, that's no problem. You know, when you put the bullet points, this is what I was talking about with your bullet points, put the highlight, but then expand on it in your talk. And that way people are listening to you rather than looking at the slides. And so use the bullet points as a highlight, but expand on it. So again, look at the audience. And if you're looking at your notes, look up once in a while. Now, I find a good trick, pick out a friendly face. And if you can see the audience, there'll be somebody who's kind of smiling or they're, they're nodding. Well, you know, I see, you know, Julia's nodding there, you know. So look at that friendly face periodically. And that helps, you know, get you. Don't, you know, if you look at someone and they go, 
you know, don't, don't do that. So, so find a friendly face, but the problem is, is when there's a really bright light out there and you can't make eye contact, I tell people do the thousand meter gaze, which is you just, you look into the blackness. And so some people get nervous with public speaking. Now, everybody's different. It, it's so funny because, you know, just being, you know, Greeks are just people where they don't say, oh my God, I have to give a talk for 10 minutes. They go, only 10 minutes? <laughs> And so, you know, you give a microphone to a Greek, they'll talk for an hour. And so I've never had a problem. People say, don't you get nervous speaking in public? It's like, no. <laughs> but if you do get nervous in public, you know, there are some tricks. And the first trick is if you don't like looking at people, if that makes you even more nervous, then what you can do is you can do, I call it the thousand meter gaze. And so just look beyond the first row out. So they think you're looking at them, but you just look out into the blackness and, and that way, sometimes people get a little bit less nervous. And so look out into the blackness. I like to make eye contact, but if that doesn't work, do the thousand meter gaze. Now, pace yourself. You know, don't talk too fast, don't talk too slow. This is where practice comes in. Because time yourself, because you don't wanna be pressured such that you have to talk so fast that people can't understand you. But if you talk too slow, you're gonna run out of time. And so, Try to pace yourself and try to keep checking yourself. And, and I've got to admit, I am um, the only time I've ever been nervous, and I didn't even realize it, is I gave what's called the Bing Course talk. And it's the big talk at Ascaris. And you know, you're there, and there's 2,000 people there, and you know, it's the opening session, and they introduce you. And I got up there, and I realized for the first 20 seconds, I was talking really fast. And fortunately, I recognized it right away, and I said, What are you doing? And so, what you do is you, you go, Take a little breath, and then the other, you know, 19 minutes and 30 seconds were fine. Your greatness came back to you. So you just, you take a breath sometimes, and even before you start, sometimes when they're introducing you, that's a good time, just a little, that's enough to do it. And so maybe when they're introducing you, go ahead and, and just take a breath, and, and that really helps. You know, relax is easy to say. Now, it, it's just like when you're operating for the first few times, you know, we used to joke about taking 10 of Inderol orally, but now just put a drop of Timoptic under your tongue, you know, or something. I mean, if that's what it takes, that's fine. If you find yourself where your heart rate's going up and your blood pressure's going up and you can feel your, you know, pulse in your neck, um, you know, take a drop of, of, you know, Timoptic under your tongue and that's sometimes just enough to, to take the edge off. But, but, you know, whatever it takes for you to relax, you know, um, just, just do that relaxation. All right, so again, you can, you can put some joke slides in there, so. We always keep forgetting when we're in surgery every once in a while, people hear everything. You know, so you don't wanna say, oh God, I'm tired today, I didn't get any sleep. I mean, don't, people hear everything. So be careful, don't talk about the basketball game last night, which was great, by the way, but don't, <laughs> don't talk about that. And so people hear everything when you're in the OR. All right, so. Enough about talking, and so I want to talk a little bit about writing, but just to highlight, when you're giving a talk, I really can't emphasize enough, prepare your materials. And so you gotta know your materials cold. And then step back after you think you've got your talk written and then say, okay, if I don't know anything about this and I'm just gonna be looking at this, am I conveying to the audience what I want to convey? And look at it that way, or again, maybe have somebody else, have one of your peers, Look at the talk, and then when you practice your talk, practice in front of people. Actually, put the timer out there, and you know, time the talk that you're going to have to do, and practice in front of people, and ask them for criticism. Okay, how's this slide? How's that slide? Are the tables good? Are they bad? And put the time in that it takes to prepare. And again, you guys have residence day coming up, so you know, put the time in to prepare the talks. And I've got to tell you, we were talking a little bit before with those who were here on time, the two of you. Um, Resident Day Talks through the years have gotten really good. And you know, you guys do a really good job at Resident Day Talks. But again, prepare them. Talk in front of your peers, you can talk to lay people, your significant others, go over them and ask them for critiques. And then go ahead and, and um, you know, actually stand up as if you're doing it. Don't just kind of sit down at your desk and do the talk. Actually stand up somewhere. Pretend like you're really giving the talk. Click through the slides like you're doing. Have the timer there and pretend you're actually giving it. Because once you do that two or three times, you'll kind of know 
that you can do it on time, you'll know that your material is good, and then after that, just do a little brief, you know, brief summary ahead of time. So I always take like, you know, either take your PowerPoint with you or take your notes with you. And when somebody else is talking, don't panic. I mean, it's like, you know, studying right before you walk into the test. Don't do that, but just kind of, you know, look at the highlights. Okay, I'm going to talk about this, this, and this. Okay, and then you're set. You're ready to go. Questions, comments? Okay, writing papers, another thing that, that, you know, nobody sits down and tells you how to do. And, you know, you guys are expected to do that a lot. So when you're writing papers, again, does this sound repetitious? Know your material. So if you're going to write a paper, know what you're writing. And you really dig into what it is that you're writing about. Look up all the references. Look up all the other papers. Know your material cold before you even start. So then look at your data. Review all the data. Know what it is you're going to write. Look at, the, look at the references. Review the statistics. Sit down with somebody and know that all ahead of time. Now, again, types of papers are just like types of talks because they're different. There's case reports. You know, case reports are, again, Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am. You know, so you want to just put the, the, the brief essentials in there. They only allow you so many references. They only allow you so many words, so many pictures. And so that's a really different paper. Now, a routine scientific article is almost like your regular five to seven minute talk. You know, it's your, your introduction, you know, materials and methods, results, discussion, conclusions. I mean, that's your, your usual paper. Now, review articles are different. Because review articles are much longer, you need to cover the entire literature. So those are huge undertakings. I mean, those are very difficult to do. And then, of course, technique papers are different because those are kind of the fluff papers. Those are, gee, isn't this neat? We did this thing. And you know, those are ones you want to have videos linked to them, and you want to have pictures in there. OK, so steps in writing the paper. I mean, the first thing is you've got to gather all your data because you want to know what it shows before you start writing. You review all the references. I find an outline really helpful. And you know, start with an outline, you know, what it is you're going to say. You can do it as an outline. You can do it almost like you're doing a PowerPoint. But put the skeleton of what you want to say in there before you start adding the parts to it. And I find that helpful. Now, the order of the paper. You know, this is, again, it, it sounds silly, but, but you know, how many people turn in junk to the journal that doesn't even have these, this stuff in there. But, you know, you want to do a title on abstract, introduction, materials and methods, results, conclusions. Okay, so how do I write a paper? And again, this is just from experience. I write the paper inside out. And what I mean by that is when you are going to write a paper, it really looks like a big thing when you're going to sit down and do it. You don't even know how to start. It's like, oh my god, how do I start this? So write up the part that's the easiest first, and that's the materials and methods. I mean, you know what you did because you did the study. And so write that first. It gets you started. And so write the materials and methods out completely, you know, as if that's going to be in the paper. Then the second thing is you write the results. And then you do all the results. You put in whatever tables you have. You put in whatever you've got. Write the results. Then go back and do the introduction. And then after that, you do the discussion. And after that, you do the abstract and conclusion. So do that last. And so if you start in the middle, inside out, it's kind of like when we're learning FACO here. You know, again, we're all OCD. We think we're going to learn FACO from step one to step 20. No, because steps, you know, one and two can screw up the whole case. And so we kind of start inside out. So the first thing you do is you remove some cortex, you put in an IOL, then you do the FACO, then you do the wound, then you do the rexus. It's kind of the same thing with the paper. Write the materials and methods first, because that's what you know already then do the results. Then you can go ahead and do the introduction and then the discussion. And then lastly, you'll do the abstract and conclusions. And so don't just sit down and say, oh, shoot, abstract, what am I going to say? Get started, and then it'll flow, and it's a lot easier that way. And especially once you start finishing all the results, then you'll say, oh, you know, this is what I really want to say, and that makes it easier. All right, so plan your time carefully. And, and I, I call this the, the rule of 10 or zero. So you say, oh, this is easy. I can do this in 10 hours. Add a zero. It's 100 hours. It's not arithmetic. It's logarithmic. And so the first time you're sitting down to write you know, some kind of a major paper, you think, oh, yeah, I could do this easy. Add a zero. And, and people, you, you'll say, no, no, no. And then you'll sit down and do it. you say, oh, my god, he's right. So it, it takes 
like, you know, logarithmic. It's 10 times as long as you think it's going to take. So plan out your time accordingly. If you think it's 10 hours, it's really going to take 100. And so give yourself lots of time to do this. Don't put it off till the end and then try to do it, you know, like you did in early college when, you know, you're writing papers and you're up at 2 a.m. typing. And, oh, you guys didn't type anymore. You're up at 2 a.m. at your computer computing, you know, <laughs> trying to put it together. So don't wait till the last minute. And then again, don't forget when people get bored, throw in some, throw in some slides that, that, you know, make it a little bit fun. Okay, so the final preparation of the paper. I can't emphasize this enough. Read it, read it again, put it down, read it again. I mean, you don't know how many times when your brain sees something, you read what you think it should say, not what it really says. And so read it, reread it, reread it over again, spell check. And you're lucky now, you've got no excuse. You've got computers now that do this for you. You don't have to pull out a book and look it up like we used to have to, you know. You've got a computer that does this automatically. Spell check, there's no excuse for any misspelling in a paper anymore. You know, the other thing, check for proper grammar. Again, grammar just, just drives editors nuts. And so, check for grammar. And, and I have great respect now for people who write papers not in their primary language. I couldn't imagine writing a paper in like, you know, Mandarin or something. I mean, that, just, that would just blow me away. And, and there are people from China and from Japan who are writing papers in English. And that, that's just, that's amazing to me that they can do that when it's not their primary language. But, you know, check for proper grammar. And this is almost like when you're practicing for your talks. Have other people read it. Have peers, have friends, have colleagues. and. This is where people can help you. I mean, even like secretaries, anybody read it to see if they'll pick up awkward sentences, you know, grammatical errors, spelling errors. And so have people read it ahead of time because you don't want a reviewer to send back your paper and say, yeah, well, it's a good idea, but the grammar's so bad, it's not worth taking. So you don't want to not have a paper accepted just because you didn't take the time to, you know, check the grammar and check the spelling and, you know, make sure it's well written. Um, check the quality of figures and graphs because nowadays when you submit papers, you do it all electronically, the journals have ways of checking it. And if you don't have enough, you know, um, megapixels in each little picture, then they won't accept it. And so each journal has, you know, their requirements. And so make sure you check and meet those requirements. So follow the instructions for the authors. You don't know how many times we get papers that come in where they've just not Follow the instructions, just blatantly didn't follow them. And we don't even review those. We just send them back. It's like, no, you know, we're not going to look at this till you do it. And there's no excuse. It's right there when you go to the instructions for the authors. It tells you step by step how you should do it and how to format it and, you know, what the photos should be in. And so spend the time to follow the instructions. Now, where to send it? People often say, where do you send this? What do you do? This is where your mentors, your superiors, people who you've worked with can be very helpful because they'll let you know. Because, you know, when you're writing a paper, and again, we all do this, we're biased, this is the greatest paper in the world. <laughs> I'm going to send this to ophthalmology. I'm going to send this to, you know, IOVS. This is the greatest paper. And then somebody else can look at it and say, yeah, well, it's okay, but, you know, maybe that's not the right place to send it. And so talk to your peers, and not, not, not your peers, I'm sorry, your mentors and people who have a little bit more experience because they can guide you on where to send this because that'll save you a lot of time. I mean, we all think our stuff is great, but you know, send it to the journal Ophthalmology. Ophthalmology accepts about 15% of what's sent in there. So unless it's a great paper, they're not going to accept it. And that's going to kill several months of time, plus make you feel bad when it gets rejected. And so be realistic about where you're going to send it to. And that's the key thing, realism. Again, be realistic about where you're going to send it to. Now, on the other hand, I often tell people, well, you never know. Give them the right of first refusal. And so if you say, okay, this isn't so timely that if it doesn't get out in the next month, it's going to be an issue. If you say, well, maybe this is a good paper to a good journal, go ahead and send it to a good journal once. And then if they reject it, then you can send it to you know, maybe a smaller journal. So that's okay, but just realize ahead of time that that's a, that's a moonshot. You know, that's like when you're applying for residency. Well, okay, yeah, you can apply to Bascom, but it's not going to cause you any harm, but, you know, who knows? All right, we're almost there. We're almost there, so. 
I love this slide because whenever you ever watch, you know, medical shows on TV, the ORs always had this gallery there, you know, and the students are watching up there. I've never seen an OR with a gallery, at least in the U.S. I haven't. All right. So what happens when a paper is sent in? And this is kind of like a black box. First of all, either the editor or the editorial staff will briefly look at a paper and then see where it's going to be assigned and, and what they're going to do with it. And then once it's assigned to a particular editor or sub-editor, they'll send it to probably at least two peer reviewers. And you don't think they spend a lot of time, but you know, as an editor, I do 12 hours a week now doing this. And so it's a lot of time and you pick out reviewers who have expertise in that area. And the other thing a good editor will do is, is even though we think we're not biased, we are. And so especially in ophthalmology, there are papers that are put together by company A, and of course company other A says, no, those aren't any good, and, and I have to spend time worrying about, okay, this guy is a, on the speakers bureau of company A, I'll never say shill, but you know, there's shill for company A, and this is for the other company A, so you have to make sure that you send it to neutral reviewers and be careful, but there's usually at least two peer reviewers in addition to an editor or sub-editor who looks at it. But the final decisions rest with the editors or the sub-editors. And so I have actually on occasion will even override a reviewer. A reviewer will say, oh, we should reject it. This is bad. And then I review their comments and I say, you know, this, this guy's really not on the money. He missed the boat. And so I'll override them. Um, the other thing we do as editors is we actually grade our reviewers. And so if we have a particularly good reviewer, we grade them high. If we have a bad one, we grade them low, and then we just don't use them anymore. And so we actually grade our reviewers because all reviewers are not equal. But the final decision is with the editor, the sub-editor. Okay, so first of all, if you get a form back that says, yes, we, um, you know, we, we're recommending revisions, that's good news. Because right now, most journals are so overwhelmed, they'll just reject it if there's any questions. So if you get a letter back that says, okay, we are going to you know, recommend these revisions, then that's great news. That means chances are, is if you do you know, what they ask and answer the questions, you'll get it accepted. So that's actually good news. So don't, you know, don't take that badly. The biggest mistake I find is that people don't re read the reviewer's comments carefully. And so every once in a while, I'll get a paper, and again, I hate to stereotype, but from a you know, very pompous German professor, you know, who's never wrong, and basically, they'll just send a long letter back, totally refuting the reviewers and not answering them, saying our paper was perfect the way it was. And, and I mean, that's when that just gets an editor going, so I'll just reject it. I'll say, well, you didn't you know, respond to the reviewers' questions, you didn't answer them, therefore, you rejected it. And then I'll get a really nasty letter back, a very haughty, letter back, professor, chairman, so-and-so, you know, Deutsche University, whatever, you know, so, but, um, you know, we read the reviewers' comments carefully and answer them. And so if you disagree with the reviewers, that's okay, but go through every one. And so if you get a list of reviewers' comments, and there's 20 of them, when you send the comments back to the, you know, editor, when you send in your revised paper, you actually do a letter ahead of time, say, okay, in response to reviewer's question one, yes, we agree with the reviewer, we're gonna change it on page five, here it is. If you disagree, that's okay, and you can say, I respectfully disagree with the reviewer on this point, we already discussed that here, and we don't feel that it's necessary to discuss it further here. Or, yes, that's a great point, but we just couldn't do that in this particular study, and maybe we'll do it in another study, but answer every point. Don't just kind of let them slide or else they're not going to do that. So again, be careful when you dispute a reviewer. You know, it's okay, but explain it well. And so say, you know, the reviewer said this, but really what we meant was that, and here's why, and explain it. And if you do, most editors are pretty good, and they'll say, okay, we'll buy that, we'll, we'll accept that. All right, so you're almost, you're, I know your brains are full, almost excused. All right, so publication time. This is the other thing that people get perturbed about. It can be up to six months after you get that paper, you know, accepted in there to see it in print. So I always tell my research fellows, you know, they want to have this printed before they start residency. It's like, it's not even going to print them when you're an intern, maybe when you're a resident. Now, the fact that journals are electronic now has cut the time down some, and a lot of journals are now doing e-publications ahead of time. So once it's officially accepted, you know, you'll see it'll say, okay, 
available electronically maybe in you know in January when the print issue won't even come out till like April and so it's available early and the thing is is once it's that got that electronic tag on it that counts as a real article so you can put that on your CV and, and you know you can claim credit for that but but just be patient don't get anxious it's going to come out eventually so patience is important now, if it's rejected following the first submission, say just, re you know, you send it to ophthalmology and they say, yeah, this is fine, but it's rejected. Take the reviewer's comments and say, okay, why did someone reject this? And then see if I can answer those comments in a revision and then send it somewhere else. So sometimes the reviewer's comments are really helpful. Hey, listen, you didn't discuss this, you didn't discuss that, it's a good paper, but, and when you revise the paper, don't just send the same paper to another journal, Look at the reviewer's comments because we'll always forward them to somebody and use those to make it a stronger paper and then try to send it somewhere else. And so use that as an experience. Don't get discouraged. You know, use it to make it a better paper. And so as, as they said in The Godfather, you know, um, one of my favorite lines is there, it's not personal, it's business, you know, when they're killing somebody. And so if you get, you know, paper rejected, remember, it's not personal. You know, it's just business, just, just, it's business. So um, don't take it personally. Just say, you know what, these guys, bless you, you know, they're only accepting anywhere, depending on the journal, from, from 10 to 30% of all papers. And so don't take it personally. Just learn from it. Try to send it somewhere else. Try to make it a better paper. But don't get discouraged. I mean, use it as a learning experience. And sometimes you'll find that, you know, every once in a while, you know, after I get over the first thing and I say, ah, what do you mean it's rejected? Then I'll look back and I'll read the reviews comments and I'll say, yeah, that really wasn't that good of a paper. Let's maybe think about, you know, maybe continuing the study but in a better way or beefing it up here or adding something here and use it as an experience and maybe you can make it a better paper by, if you can extend the study or you're in the lab, you could do more tests or something, use it to make it a better um, you know, a better one. And then, of course, what everybody says, whenever you get beaten down, they say, well, it's a learning experience, you know. I love when they say that. Yeah, well, you just got hit over the head with a hammer, but it's a learning experience, so use it as such. All right, and so again, practice makes perfect. First time you do a paper, it's excruciating. Second time, it's a little less bad. By the time you do 100 of these, they get, you know, you get pretty good at these. And so, just like anything else, just like doing FACOs, you know, practice makes perfect, and eventually you'll get good at doing this, and you'll be able to crank them out quicker. All right, that's it. Questions?